What's up everyone, welcome to the Hi-Fi Turtle. If you follow me on Instagram, you might have noticed that I recently got the Benchmark LA4 line preamplifier. And this is something I'm gonna be talking about soon in combination with my Benchmark DAC 3L. But one of the things that I really struggled with when I was thinking about getting this product was, why do I need a preamplifier? What does a preamplifier do that my current DAC does not? What about digital preamps like the one that was in the Rose RS150B that I talked about? And a preamp is basically just a volume control. And I think that while you can take a DAC and it converts digital to analog signal, you think, oh yeah, there's a lot going on there. Or you take an amplifier and it's got cool stuff like big honking transformers and lots of watts and one horsepower of power. But unlike a time skip anime where we just have to accept the fact that the main character can go back 12 years in time when they shake someone's hand, there's actual science that goes into a preamplifier and what makes a digital and analog preamplifier different, how they attenuate volume. So that's what we're gonna go over in this video. Stay tuned. All right, so I put on my glasses so I look a little bit smarter, although I am an Asian on YouTube talking about math, so already got some plus points there. So with analog volume control, there's a few different ways you can implement this. You can use resistors, you can use relays. There's of course arguments about potentiometers and other things, but essentially all of these analog methods are just ways to reduce the voltage level of the signal. On the flip side, digital volume control doesn't have an analog signal to work with where it can reduce that voltage. So instead, it takes the bits of data and basically removes bits from that data in order to reduce the volume. And that may seem very confusing, like how does removing a bit equal a reduction in noise? Well, luckily there's a mathematical equation to show this. So I'm gonna show you that mathematical equation right now. You don't have to worry too much about what this really means. But in layman's terms, basically one bit reduction will equivalently equal to a six dB reduction in sound. So in this case, S and R is the signal to noise ratio expressed in dB, and N is the number of bits that we have. So in the digital domain, each bit is a value. It's going to either be a zero or a one. And that's why you have the value two here because there's two possible expressions there's zero and one. So in the case of a 16-bit signal, this is going to be two to the 16th. 24-bit signal, two to the 24th. So two to the 16th gives us 65,536 possible values. Well, two to the 24th gives us 16,777,000 216 possible values. So there's a large difference between a 16-bit signal and a 24-bit signal. Most modern high-end DACs actually calculate signal in 32 bits. So if we do the calculation there, it's 2 to the 32nd, this is 4,294,967,296 possible values. So taking these values and then turning them into actual meaningful decibel values, we can take 16 dB equal to 96.33 dB, 24 being equal to 144.49 dB, and 32 being 192.66 dB. So why is this expression in dB of any consequence? And we're expressing this in signal to noise ratio. Well, the importance is the actual noise floor. So this is the part where I start to kind of interpret these results on my own because I couldn't find anyone to really explain this extremely well, or at least simple enough where I could really start to understand it. I don't know. Maybe I'm stupid. I didn't go to Carnegie Milan. If you disagree with me, go ahead and drop a comment. Tell me you went to Carnegie Milan. Tell me how much smarter and better you are. Yeah. So we're going to make a graph here and just express this in frequency and then signal. So let's just say for now on this part of the graph, we're going to have 0 to 20K. 
doesn't really matter all the in-between values. We'll just put in the middle here, we'll put 1K because that's typically a, a good test tone. And then over here, we'll put negative 120 dB. It's like right there. And then zero dB up here. So let me just draw basically a random audio signal. And let's say this is just a pretty high performing DAC to have this kind of noise ratio. So then we have our tone that goes to one kilohertz. Our, that's our test tone. And we got some more squiggles all around that negative 120 mark. And so this is probably a 24 bit signal. So let's just assume that all this noise here basically equates to negative 120. And our test tone is perfectly at zero. So our dynamic range in this case is 120 dB. And dynamic range is basically the difference between the quietest part of the signal and the loudest part of the signal. So now let's say I'm using a digital preamp and I want to reduce the volume of this signal. So how do I do that? Well, I have to remove a bit, which means that our bandwidth is going to shrink because at 24, we can have a maximum bandwidth of 144 dB essentially. So we're gonna lop off a bit. So this is gonna go from two to the 24th to two to the 23rd. And we're gonna reduce our volume by essentially six dB. Cause like we said earlier, one bit is essentially six dB. So now we're at a negative six dB signal. This is gonna be our new reference point. So what happens to the noise? What happens to all the noise down here? Well, in most cases with digital preamps, this noise doesn't actually go down. This is what they call quantization noise. And it's a result of the calculation being different when you lop off that bit. So like I said earlier, these bits are representations in zeros and ones. So I'm not gonna actually do the calculation here and, and use real math, unfortunately. But let's just say that at zero dB at our peak signal, this expression is this bit Kodak. So let's see, just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, <laughs> I forgot to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay, so this is our 24 bit signal. So let's just say this is equal to, when you express, when you express this data, in from binary to an actual integer, you get, let's say 25,000, all right? I don't know if this would really calculate to that. I'm just making up numbers as we go along, just as an example. So now we wanna reduce the volume a certain amount. Let's say it's negative six dB here. So then all of a sudden, the digital calculation and the integer expression goes down to, we're just gonna make up a number, another number here. It's gonna be 12,000. All right, but now we don't. We are missing one bit. Well, actually, let's make it. Let's make it twelve thousand point one five three because it's often a uh, not a perfect integer when you do this volume reduction. And this is the this is the perfect number. This is the number that we want to get. And then we do our expression: one zero one four five six seven seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Okay, and we do our 23 bit expression to equal this. Well, does this 20 bit expression, 24, 23 bit expression equal 12,000.153? Well, in some cases it may not because we are missing the ability to have the full 24 bit signal. We can't actually express the correct integer value with only 24 bits of data. So what ends up happening is this does not equal 12,000.153, it equals 12,001.67. And this, and this calculation difference may seem very small, but because there's an error in the math, it introduces noise into the signal, which is the quantization noise I was talking about a little bit earlier. So the actual noise itself does not go down any, but our signal goes down. So now our noise is still at let's say negative 20 dB just for simplicity's sake, but our signal's now at negative six. So our 120 dynamic range signal has now gone down to 114. And as we continue to go down the level of volume, so let's say now it's negative 60. 
all of a sudden our noise ratio is now incredibly bad. At 60 dB, that's really not that great of a dynamic range. You're going to have a lot of noise popping up in that signal because this is the signal that's just leaving the DAC. This is going to get amplified by the amplifier. So the signal may go back up or, you know, be amplified, but also the noise is going to be amplified with that as well. So this is the disadvantage with digital preamps. Now, this is just an example. And most high-end modern DACs today are calculating in 32-bit. So even if you are feeding it a 16-bit signal that doesn't have very many possible values, the DAC itself will take that signal and use a filter that will upsample it to a 32-bit signal. In which case, when you have so many more bits, the quantization error, the mathematical error difference, either is non-existent or is so infinitesimally small, smaller than this. And in which case, you would see the noise floor decrease and you wouldn't get this horrible depreciating dynamic range. All right, so the question now becomes, if this is true and most high-end DACs or even moderately priced DACs are calculating in 32-bit and there's no issue with noise or reduction in dynamic range, why do you need an analog preamplifier? Well, while you probably won't depreciate the dynamic range that much, it will still depreciate a little bit as you reduce the volume. So using an extremely transparent, low noise analog preamplifier that exceeds the performance of the DAC capabilities, which is typically limited to actually 21 D, uh, bits when it comes to integrated circuits. You can only ever really get 21 bits of linearity, which takes you down to a maximum of about 130 dB. If the performance of the preamplifier's analog circuit can exceed the 130 dB, then the preamplifier will on paper outperform the capabilities of the DAC. Now, whether or not you can actually hear a signal that is negative 130 dB, I would say you probably cannot. I would say the threshold of human hearing is typically around 100, and in some cases it may be at 80. Okay, so that was a lot. So essentially the DAC3L does use a digital preamp, and it's using the ESS Sabre 9028 Pro DAC. So a very competent DAC that has incredible signal to noise ratio specs, a DAC that upsamples to 32 bits when it handles the digital signal before converting it to analog. So why on earth do you need to spend $2,500 for an LA4? Well, the LA4 is that analog preamplifier that has better signal to noise processing than the 130 dB that's possible on an integrated circuit. And the benchmark, I don't think has perfect linearity with this. I think it's more like 20 bits. So then we're talking about basically 121, something like that dB. So in that regard, the LA4 can enhance the ability of the benchmark to produce high fidelity sound. But like I said, the audibility of this is questionable. So what improvements am I going to find with the LA4? Will there be any improvements? Will I recommend the LA4? Well, that's for the LA4 review. So that's coming down the road, wait for that. But with other preamplifiers or other DACs that may not have the same caliber of chip in them or have other limitations, or maybe you just wanna add flavor to your sound with some sort of preamplifier, like a tube preamplifier. There's not as many tube DACs out there, but there are a lot of tube preamplifiers you can have. So that's also, so that's also a subjectivity question. But in regards to digital versus analog volume control, there are a vast number of differences. How they do things is very different, but digital volume attenuation has really come a long way and is now at the level where I feel like it can spec wise compete with analog volume control. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was informative. I hope I'm right on this. If I'm totally wrong, drop a comment, explain to me why I'm wrong.
but this is the best way that I can understand it. There's actually a really great explanation from the CTO of ESS themselves from way back in the day at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest. I'll put that link below in the description. So if you wanna go watch his explanation of this, and I got a lot of this from his explanation and his models that he uses in this video. So definitely check that, that out as well. Make sure you hit that thumbs up, make sure you subscribe, Check the links below in the description. There's Patreon, there's other affiliated links in there that really help me out and give me the ability to continue making videos like this. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.